Welcome to the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum's web series, Hiring and Retaining Aboriginal Apprentices, an Action Plan for Employers. The Forum is hosting this series of webinars to help educate employers and provide tips on how to successfully create a more diverse workforce. Our current project, Hiring and Retaining Aboriginal Apprentices, is intended to facilitate the hiring and retention of Indigenous apprentices in skilled trades workplaces. We have developed an action plan that draws upon sector-specific strategies and practices that skilled trades employers have found effective when it comes to developing partnerships with Indigenous communities. We are pleased to welcome the Progressive Contractors Association of Canada. PCA's member companies employ more than 25,000 skilled trades construction workers across Canada and provides advocacy, labour management advice and organisational services to its member community. PCA's advisory services provide strategic counsel on a variety of topics, one of which supports their members in developing an Aboriginal inclusion strategy. We are pleased to welcome Carrie Miller, Vice President of Member Services with PCA, who will share the best practices from across Canada's construction industry. Carrie's experience as an executive in the construction industry, leading a full spectrum of human resources and labour relations functions across Canada, has made her one of the industries most well-versed in the country's varied laws, regulations, union environments and global construction climate. Carrie is a member of the Construction Owners Association of Alberta Apprenticeship Retention Committee and has sat on various boards and committees with the Aboriginal Human Resource Council's Leadership Circle, Construction Sector Council, Skills Canada, Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and the Employers Advocacy Council. Thanks for joining us today, Carrie. Thank you, Racine. It's my pleasure today to talk about developing an Aboriginal inclusion strategy. As you mentioned, I work within the construction industry, but a lot of the content we're going to be talking about today and the advice really is applicable to many different sectors and employers across Canada. So the Aboriginal population is really an untapped resource in many ways in Canada. The Aboriginal population is growing at more than four times the rate of non-Indigenous populations in Canada, and more than half of those folks live in cities, and 46% are under the age of 24. So really that's quite a resource and an opportunity for employers in Canada. So we're going to talk about why to develop an Aboriginal inclusion strategy. First and foremost, it's the right thing to do. But there are many other benefits as well. Obviously, you know, having an inclusive workplace provides employers with access to local workforce and supports a positive reputation of your company. And really, the general public and shareholders care about that today. They want to know that the companies they work with and work for have good reputations and that they are effective in working with Aboriginal people across Canada. Once your organization demonstrates that they can do this effectively and do this well, other business opportunities open up and become available to your organization as well. So there's really a business case to develop a strong Aboriginal inclusion strategy in your organization. We're going to talk about a number of factors relating to an element of an Aboriginal inclusion strategy and why we call it a strategy because really this is more than just a policy. This is a multifaceted corporate approach to inclusion. We're going to talk about several of those facets today. One being understanding some requirements that may already be in place for projects you wish to bid work on, understanding what contractual agreements may already be in place that you will have to abide by. We'll discuss the importance of developing a corporate Aboriginal inclusion or diversity policy. We'll talk about some best practices in community engagement. We'll talk about how to make sure that your workforce and supervisors are prepared to work with Aboriginal folks by ensuring they have appropriate training. We'll talk about how to coordinate some funding opportunities and we'll talk about best practices and challenges around employment and procurement. And lastly, we'll provide you with some Aboriginal inclusion partners and resources that you can use to help you along this journey. When developing an Aboriginal inclusion strategy, it's important to understand why this is relevant to your company today. Are you looking to bid on a project in the immediate future or are you looking at work down the road where you feel this will be relevant to your organization? Many projects across Canada, in particular natural resource projects, water treatment plants, hydro projects, dams, road building, a lot of these projects today, including federally and provincially funded public projects, will be located near or on Aboriginal communities. And these projects will have very specific requirements for any companies or contractors wanting to bid work on those projects that must be met in order to demonstrate commitment to work with the local Aboriginal communities. In fact, some of those projects will already have 
formal contractual agreements in place that anyone looking to work on that project will have to abide by. Those are called impact and benefit agreements, which we will discuss next. The success of your bid will be actually weighed on the quality and effectiveness of this particular Aboriginal inclusion section of the bid package you submit. Impact and benefit agreements are used all across Canada for any projects or jobs that are built in or around Aboriginal communities. These are the common standard and the primary means to establish a formal relationship between the project developer and the locally impacted community or communities. These are contractual agreements that will outline the conditions and expectations of a variety of elements on that project. For example, if a mine is being built in northern Canada, that mine may be near several Aboriginal communities that will be impacted by the construction of this mine depending on the size of it, as well as the mine may require a number of access roads to be built that may also pass through several other Aboriginal communities. And that mining company will have already spent weeks months and perhaps years working with each one of those Aboriginal communities to put in place formal agreements called impact and benefit agreements. Those agreements will clearly outline expectations and conditions that the mining company will have to meet to work with each one of those impacted communities. And why impact and benefit agreements are important to project developers, why they would want those in place are a number of reasons. Firstly, they will help minimize the risk of any opposition or delay to the project and make sure that their return on investment is maximized. Having an effective impact benefit agreement will ensure that the community will actually become a proponent of the project instead of an opponent. And of course, it will help the developer demonstrate social responsibility. Why an impact benefit agreement is important to these communities are for several reasons as well. Firstly, there will be contractual recognition of the community's territorial rights. There will be formal commitments made to ensure that the community is able to maximize economic benefits and these are things such as employment opportunities for community members, procurement opportunities for local Aboriginal businesses, other contributions to the community, and royalty payments that the communities may want to see from the proceeds of the project. An effective impact benefit agreement will also ensure that there will be formal contractual obligations to ensure that environmental impacts of the traditional lands are minimized. So impact benefit agreements, IBAs, are critical components to any successful project and they are things that your organization will want to be very familiar with before you bid any work on a project such as this. So once you understand the requirements that might be already in place to bid on a project and you've taken the time to learn about and in any impact benefit agreements that may already be in place that you will have to abide by, it's then time to ensure that you have an effective policy in place. So if you don't already have a good diversity policy, you'll want to create one now or consider having a separate Aboriginal inclusion policy or adding a separate Aboriginal inclusion section into your existing diversity policy. Now, of course, a belief in Aboriginal inclusion cannot come from the HR department this must come from the leadership of an organization and be disseminated down throughout the organization so that it permeates at every level and there's buy-in at every level. Please see some resources available on this slide that provide some sample policies and best practices on how to do this effectively. The most important part of your Aboriginal inclusion strategy is how you effectively engage with the community. It's important to keep in mind that each Aboriginal community is unique. Even though they may be in close proximity to each other, they will have unique histories, unique priorities, unique challenges, and unique objectives for their communities. So don't assume that just because something has worked well with the community you've worked with in the past, that it will work well with the community you're working with today. It's very important to take the time to research the communities you're going to be meeting with ahead of time, really understanding who the leaders are within the community, what the community composition is, what their history is, and really how some of their culture works before you go and meet with them. It's also very important to send decision makers when meeting with community leaders in person. They will be ensuring that decision makers are in the room and it's important that you do the same thing. And then the key is to really listen to what is important to the community. Don't assume every community wants a hockey rink. Take the time to ask questions about what is important to each community, understand what some of their concerns might be regarding the project, what are some of the fears, and really consider ways to help set up the community for success after you leave. So you may be working on a mine, as we used as an example earlier, and you may be performing construction work on that mine for the next five years. 
but that mine might be up and running for the next 30 to 40 years, and when you've left town, what is important to that community, and are there ways that you can help set that community up for success for the long run? Are there ways you could perhaps bring in some training to help that community set up a catering company or a maintenance company, things that they can actually use to engage with the mine and bring resources and economic development to their community for the duration of that project. It's important to learn about the community, attend different community events, and be really willing to think outside the box and develop alternative hiring and training methods to reach candidates and community members. You want to be clear with the community leaders at this point about what the job requirements are, what type of jobs you think you'll be offering throughout the duration of the project, what some of your expectations are, and what some of the job conditions might be. Don't set unrealistic or unachievable expectations in your commitments. At this stage, this is about making sure that any commitments you set are realistic so that you can build trust and build upon your successes. You never want to overpromise and underdeliver. This is the fastest way to break trust, and trust is key when working with Aboriginal communities. Try not to use overcomplicated technical jargon in your job ads or limit potential candidates by requiring credentials that aren't really necessary. And you also can't assume that people will want to self-identify. So you may have commitments made with a local community to hire a certain number of community members or a certain number of Aboriginal people. However, if those folks aren't willing to self-identify and let you know that they are indeed Aboriginal, you may not be able to report some of those numbers. So it's important to understand that that's a very private matter that people will determine themselves whether they want to self-identify or not. And you can have those discussions ahead of time with the community leaders. If you know you're going to be working within a community or on a project for a number of years or hiring a number of people, you may want to consider hiring an Aboriginal liaison coordinator full-time for that project. And that person's job is to really ensure that there's clear communication between the community and the employers, making sure that policies and practices are being met, commitments are being met, and they can really manage all of those expectations in a very effective way. You want to set up your new employees with the most success possible. And in order to do that, it's important to make sure that your own organization has already been trained with the topic of cultural awareness or culture sensitivity. At a minimum, you want to ensure that management, frontline supervisors, and union stewards should participate in this training, although it is best practices to ensure that all employees be trained in this as well. Here are some resources that you can use with organizations that actually provide cultural awareness or cultural sensitivity training across Canada. Locally impacted communities are often recipients of numerous sources of funding, including funding from various branches of governments. This is funding that you may actually be able to access as an employer in order to train or recruit folks from the community to work on your project. For an example I can think of is a community that had about approximately 30 community members and had received $4 million of funding through two branches of government for training opportunities for that community. So any contractors or employers looking to hire people from the community could have access to that funding in order to purchase equipment, materials, tools that could help train those folks in order to get jobs on the project. So if you want to be asking community leaders, project owners, or do research yourself to find out if the community has already received any grants or funding that you could use to coordinate with and help train and employ those people from the community. So now you'd like to actually recruit and hire people. And in order to do that, you want to, again, refer back to that impact and benefit agreement and understand if there are any local hiring requirements that already exist that are already in place for a particular project. You want to then go and create awareness within each of the communities about the jobs that are going to be available. So if there's high schools in the region, you may want to go to the high schools, you may want to put on job fairs, attend to community events, make sure that the community is aware of who you are, what your company represents, what you're all about, what types of jobs might be available what types of training might be available. Make sure you're getting that word out. You want to make sure that you're advertising in places that actually target those local community folks as well, so you can go to the community leaders and ask them how is it best to reach their community members. Are there local radio stations that people listen to, or community boards? What's really the best way to let people know about the opportunities that are available? You want to ensure that the job descriptions are unbiased and that you really understand what the communities have access to in terms of resources. So many rural communities simply don't have access to the internet or their internet access is very sporadic. They have limited computers. In many cases, there's no fax lines. 
so you're going to want to think outside the box to reach these candidates. If your current recruitment process requires candidates to apply online or email their resume uh, or complete some training online, this is simply not going to work if you're trying to recruit out of a rural community that doesn't have internet or only has sporadic internet access. So you really want to talk about this with the community leaders and find out how the best way is to reach those folks. You want to establish clear step-by-step -step hiring protocols for everyone involved in the hiring process, and this needs to be very, very detailed. So if there are several different impacted communities that you will be working with, there will be a clear protocol about which order job postings will be offered to for each community, which community will receive the job postings first, then second, then third, and so on. And you want to have clear processes in place in writing that will let you know who do you send these job postings to, how will those postings be communicated to the rest of the community, how will you receive applications from community members, how can you be interviewing folks, how can you be hiring folks, and really understanding exactly what every one of those steps are. I can think of one of our contractor members who had gone through all of that process and established very clear steps of they were going to be sending out job postings every Monday morning to the local band office, sending them via fax, and then after a few weeks they were they discovered that the, unfortunately the band office was actually not being staffed regularly and therefore community members were not being uh, made aware of the different job postings available. So their response to this challenge was they actually took a construction trailer and they shipped it the hundreds of kilometers uh, into this local community and they set up a permanent recruitment trailer right there in the community and staffed it with a recruiter full time. So folks were able to walk down the street from their homes, walk right into the job trailer, right away able to see the different postings that were available, the different training opportunities, actually apply in person and try to be hired right there. So this is something that you may want to have to think outside the box in order to reach community members and make sure that you're hiring folks. It's important to remember that community members may have limited formal training and formal credentials, but they may have lots of good relevant experience that will be helpful to your project. A common challenge with rural communities is that many folks don't have driver's licenses, so you may need to get creative and come up with a creative solution to help employees get to site. Another example that springs to mind with one of our contractor members when they discovered this challenge was they simply went and purchased a school bus and hired a full-time driver that would actually leave the job site every day, drive out to the local communities that were about 30 to 40 minutes away, pick up the workers in the morning, and bring them to the project to work each day. And that way those folks were still able to get to the project site. You want to ensure that your payroll department is very well versed in the taxation laws and exemptions as well. This would be very important to the community. There are specific Canada revenue laws uh, that are different for Aboriginal community folks and it's very specifically outlined where the work needs to be performed in order to have different income tax laws apply. So you will want to make sure that your payroll department is quite up to speed on this and that you've had these clear discussions with the community leaders as well so that each person performing work on your project will understand what their taxation will look like. You also want to work with community contacts to determine if any of the folks you're hiring are eligible for other community support. So oftentimes uh, Aboriginal communities will have additional resources to help support their community members that can provide things like tools, workwear, transportation, and some of those folks that you're hiring may be eligible for that, those separate resources as well. So you'll want to work with community contacts to determine that. And then, of course, once you've hired folks, you want to make sure that you're holding an orientation, providing everybody with clear expectations and setting them up for the best success of what they need to be successful on their project. And then you want to be measuring those successes and celebrating them. This slide provides you with some recruitment resources and methods to actually reach Aboriginal candidates across Canada. Some of these resources are job boards that you're able to post with and others are organizations that will connect employers with Aboriginal candidates. When it comes to procurement practices for these projects, priority will be given to Aboriginal or local communities to supply goods and materials and services to the project. So contractors looking to actually perform construction work on a project may give priority to local Aboriginal businesses in order to supply some of those tools or equipment or materials in order to help them perform that construction work. These may actually be requirements of the project and outlined in the impact benefit agreements. I've provided some resources here on how to source Aboriginal businesses across Canada that you can partner with in order to 
provide these procurement opportunities. This slide provides some additional partners and resources for you that can help guide you through developing an Aboriginal inclusion strategy, providing Aboriginal inclusion training, developing policies, and so on. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak on the topic of developing Aboriginal inclusion. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, for sharing uh, all this valuable information with us. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, CAF has developed an action plan that draws upon sector-specific strategies and practices that skilled trades employers have found effective when it comes to developing partnerships with Indigenous communities. The report is available for free download on our website. Our YouTube channel is a great source of content, and you'll find more information on creating a diverse workforce by visiting youtube.com slash CAF Apprenticeship. The Skilled Trades Network is a tool created by the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum to provide resources for employers and apprentices. Employers can visit to find tips on recruitment, mentoring, retention, and links to current financial incentives. The Canadian Apprenticeship Forum is a national non-for-profit organization working with stakeholders in all regions of Canada. We influence pan-Canadian apprenticeship strategies through research, discussion, and collaboration, sharing insights across trades, across sectors, and across the country to promote apprenticeship as an effective model for training and education. If you would like to stay in touch, please be sure to connect with us on one of our social media channels.